What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the park, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of inspiredinsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And I will introduce, formally introduce uh, Cameron Healy in a second. But Cameron, I like to point out some past episodes that people should check out. And I love having the brands and the people who have created things I love, okay? And you're one of those people, by the way. Um, and, you know, creating Kona Brewing and Kettle Chips and um, but some of the past ones, uh, we have a mutual friend, Holly Lyman, uh, the founder of Wild Tonic. And um, if you're watching the video, like she's got these beautiful, <laughs> beautiful bottles. She sent and some samples. Yeah, I mean, I, I went into a grocery store, mm-hmm. a specialty store. I bought it. It sticks out to you because, as you know her from the glass blowing days, I'm like, wow, that is amazing. And I tried it and it's even more amazing. And I snapped a shot of it and I emailed them. I'm like, I would love to have you on my podcast. I'm a huge fan of your kombucha. And um, I've had the founders of Big League Chew, um, Bill Nelson. He has a super interesting story about being uh, just in the bullpen of a, a minor league team and coming up with, he didn't want to chew tobacco and you know he wanted some kind of healthier alternative and he came up with shredded gum, you know, and uh, Bram from Letco, he's got this healthier version of uh, Nutella that he came up with. So just some really cool brands. And and Cameron will take us to the genesis, uh, back to the genesis of creation, which you said before, which I love that. Um, but before I introduce Cameron, this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their dream 100 relationships. Um, And we do that by helping you run your podcast. And, you know, for me, Cameron, the number one thing in my life is relationships. And I'm always looking at a way to give to my best relationships, profile them, shout from the rooftops what they're working on and what they're doing. And I've seen no better way over the past over decade to have people on my podcast and let people know what they're doing and what they're working on. So if you've thought about creating a podcast out there, you should. And if you have questions, you could go to rise25.com and email us. Um, Today's guest uh, is Cameron Healy, who founded Kona Brewing Company and Kettle Chips. Yes, the kettle chips, the delicious kettle chips that we know and love. And he also runs the Healy Foundation, which is um, after his parents. And um, I'm going to have, you know, Cameron talk about his parents a little bit and their journey. But Cameron, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jeremy. It's an honor to be here. So tell me a little bit more. I want to start almost in reverse for a second and and talk about the Healy Foundation. Okay. Uh, Yeah, the Healy Foundation um, is really, um, in a lot lot of ways, is sort of of my end game, I I suppose, without, um, without having, you know, when I started, it wasn't necessarily didn't mean that, but it was uh, started about uh, 1996, um, and it was really uh, to, uh, it was a 501c3 was created to put on a Celtic music festival uh, that I organized with some friends in Oregon, outside of Oregon. It was a three-day camping thing, um, and uh, I was sort of in a mode of re-embracing my Celtic roots and my family roots, which are very Irish. And I thought the, uh, my father had recently passed away and I thought it'd be a nice way to honor him and raise some money for battered and abused uh, women and children, um, which was a cause that he, he favored. Um, and so did that and um, uh, had a, a fabulous show. The only problem was uh, in early September of that year of 90, <clears throat> 96, we picked the weekend that was statistically the least uh, rainfall. And of course it rained three inches that weekend and it was a camping, you could camp there and and it was in a state park. And uh, so it was a little bit like a mini Woodstock where- That's what I was saying, it's a modern day Woodstock, right? People were in mud and those that did come uh, 
huddled together and had just a great, <clears throat> great experience. Uh, our headliner, uh, Ashley McIsaac from Canada, uh, was going to be our headliner. I think we had 20 some Celtic music uh, groups and individuals. He got busted for pot at the U.S. border, so he couldn't show up. So we had to shift people around. But um, we lost a little bit of money, but we still put some money into the into the cause. The next year, we actually made made some money. The sun did shine. Um, but I decided that uh, doing outdoor events to raise money um, in the nonprofit world probably wasn't the smartest thing to do in Oregon. And to be consistent, I've been involved in a uh, outdoor event in Hawaii for 25 years. It actually has been very successful, but the difference is uh, you're in Hawaii. The sun is usually shiny, shiny here in Kona. Uh, but um, the in '99, I hired an executive director, a friend of mine, to really create a plan, and and it was really around uh, youth, um, uh, youth, uh, the environment, and community. Uh, was our our mission, and um, I've been funding the foundation ever since, sort of progressively, as I've built businesses and sold them. I've donated shares before selling, and um, funded an endowment, uh, which has grown over the years. And um, you know that endowment today represents about fifty percent of my estate. And when I pass away, um, uh, Essentially, all of the the balance will go into the foundation. So it's meant to be a perpetual foundation. Uh, we have a small team, uh, um, uh, executive director, um, uh, second uh, executive director, and uh, our original one retired, but is still a board member. And um, so we've got um, got a younger younger crew of program directors in their forties and. Uh, to carry it on uh, into the future. Our, our geographical focus is state of Oregon and the state of Hawaii doing, doing that work. And uh, those are two places that I uh, live and I split my time between the two and love both environments. And so it's great, great opportunity to make a difference and have an impact in these places. Um, Cameron, I'd love to hear um, what it was like growing up. What were your parents like growing up? Uh, you know, I'm a I'm a baby boomer. I'm right, sort of statistically in the the middle of the age group of the baby boomers. And so, uh, my parents were sweethearts when they were 15 years old. My father went off to to war when he was uh, 18, almost 19, and you know saw a lot of combat in the 10th Mountain Division and the Italian Mountains, and came back, survived that, and they married, and uh, he went to college on GI Bill. My mother went through college in Oregon um, um, you know, during the war. She said there weren't many men there uh, at the University of Oregon during the war, but they all came back with uh, GI Bills. But anyway, my father, by um, late 40s, had a bachelor's degree. And, um, uh, uh, and the first child was my sister, who was born in 1949, and they moved from Portland, Oregon, to uh, a place called Bend, Oregon, which was a little mill town about three hours from Portland to manage. My father had a job to manage a furniture store that had been the original furniture store in that region, founded in 1916, that his father, who was a furniture manufacturer, had some interest in. And so they moved over. Uh, they were pregnant with me. 1950. I was born in 51. And, uh, you know, it was a pretty idyllic place to grow up. It was a little mill town. It was I've heard amazing things about Ben. Oh, yeah, it's a real fast growing place now. But it's, uh, it's got a it's got, you know, it's at the foot of the Cascades, east side of the Cascades. Uh, one side is the mountains, the other side is the high desert. Uh, river runs right through it. Uh, very pristine kind of place. And, uh, you know, the timber uh, cutting trees and making lumber was the dominant industry and, and hunting and fishing was the dominant sport. My father, having grown up skiing on Mount Hood in Oregon and been in the 10th Mountain Division, trained in Colorado, mountain warfare, um, was a lover of the mountains. 
And uh, so moving over to Bend, Oregon, he connected with a local ski club there that had been started by Scandinavian um, timber industry workers in 1927 and started hiking up this mountain called uh, ba- called Mount Bachelor and uh, skiing down. And they talked about for decades that mountain had always had beautiful, ample snow and dry snow and it was a beautiful mountain. So he got, my father got the idea to start a ski resort up there and he opened his uh, ski resort, uh, had a hard time getting local people to invest because they didn't think that people would travel very far to come skiing in Central Oregon. And uh, he persevered um, and opened it with a rope tow and a pommel lift and a little warming lodge Nineteen uh, when I was seven years old. And I was there skiing the first day it was open. But so I grew up in, in the ski resort industry and grew up on that mountain. And my father was a, was an entrepreneur. And I, um, I learned by observing, not knowing that I was learning, but in a way, he kind of groomed me to follow in his footsteps eventually. Uh, my mother was a college educated, a degree, a degree in interior design. And so they ran this furniture store um, as well. My mother would design, um, you know, space for clients and organize furniture for them to put in their spaces. And, you know, the 50s was a great economic boom, the 50s and the 60s. And it was good. But my father's real passion love was skiing and building the ski resort. And uh, uh, they ran this, this, uh, this retail furniture store until the 70s and eventually closed it and sold the sold the building but uh, the office for the ski resort for years was right in the furniture store so it was pretty pretty humble beginnings but ultimately the ski resort grew into a world class ski resort as a destination and my father was one of the early people that saw had a vision for central oregon to not just be a place that people would come in winter and go skiing, but to be a year-round destination, uh, recreation-based economy. And that's that's essentially how it's evolved today. Um, and uh, I think I think you'd be happy with it. It's just, you know, it's grown lots of arms and legs and population is many, many fold what it, what it was when he was alive. But, uh, you know, I, um, I was lucky enough to uh, assimilate um, his strengths uh, with managing people and following a vision and watching him sweat through the the hard years and the hard days when it didn't snow. And, and um, my mother uh, had a great aesthetic sense and uh, a good eye. And I think I got some of that from my mom, but they were great parents. And uh, it was, you know, it was kind of an Irish Catholic town when my family arrived there. So I grew up in that in that community and um my old my old school is now a, a pub and a brewery uh with the classrooms turned into hotel rooms and they uh um so you can visit often when you go back. yeah well i have yeah. a, a room that's named after me when they uh the mcminimum brothers that have uh 50 historical sites where they convert them to these lifestyle places and um they uh, this because it was the former owned by the former Catholic Church and part of the Catholic community. They interviewed a lot of people from the community, uh, including myself and my sister. But uh, later they came back and said, "Well, we're naming rooms after different characters, and we'd like to name a room and tell your story inside." And so um, they did uh, inside the room with kind of a cobbled together bio that was a little bit embarrassing. Um, my mother on the opening day came and read it and she sort of raised her eyebrows. I think it emphasized my uh, counterculture LSD days a little bit too much. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, it's still there and I, I get to stay there occasionally. I don't get a discount. unfortunately. <laughs> Cameron, tell me, um, you mentioned your dad and, and you learned a lot observing. What were some of the lessons you learned that you then took into your businesses? Um, what I, you know, what I learned from my dad was really the courage to follow your convictions and believe in, believe in what's possible. Um, and, um, also to over, you know, overcome barriers that get 
put in front of you when may it, it may be a, a lack of funding to um, move things forward, the, you know, capital the way you want, uh, or, um, you know, um, problems where, you know, the equipment breaks down and customers are not happy. And, you know, I watched them, watched them deal with that. Um, but, you know, really around, you know, following your passion, having a passion and staying true to that for years and decades and build on it some systematically and also um, building an, an organization culture that is very people centric, that has a lot of respect for the employees and really um, creating a community, a kind of a culture, a culture and a community around your mission uh, of the business. And uh, so I very much um, took those and I took those with me, which I didn't know I had those until I started my first business at age 21. I just did it on a impulse, but found there was kind of some hard wiring for some of these um, kind of um, values, I guess, around and um, approaches to running a business. So take me back. You're 21. What's your idea? <laughs> well, I'm, uh, I'm 21. Um, you know, I mentioned I'm a baby boomer and, you know, was very much a product of the 60s. Uh, time I was finishing high school and going to college and my hair was getting pretty long and uh, and you know my beliefs in you know a gener a, the power of a generation through music and alternative lifestyle choices that we could build a better world uh, Vietnam War was continuing to rage uh, I had you know right right First year into college was 1969, University of Washington. Uh, it was a hotbed for student anti-war protest, and I got very much swept up into that movement, and you know all the alternative values that go with that. So, uh, you know, my dad was a World War II veteran, and um, you know we didn't we didn't see eye to eye politically. Ultimately, you know, I went away to college for an education, and I think more of my education was the environment of college than, than probably the classroom part of it. But I, you know, my own way, I thrived, but, you know, my parents didn't really understand <laughs> my path as many parents did. But um, by the time I was 21, um, I had um, just finished my junior year of college. I, by then, had moved back to Oregon. I'm an Oregon native. I was at the uh, University of Oregon, but I had adopted as part of my counterculture path uh, that previous summer, uh, which was 1970. I'd gone to Japan with a close friend. We hitchhiked for seven weeks, um, had a really amazing trip, but it really kind of turned into, in a way, kind of a spiritual journey where we met people along the way, Westerners as well as Japanese were practicing Zen meditation. Uh, we stayed on a, a commune, the southern island of Japan of Kyushu, uh, a hippie commune of, of Japanese that were practicing yoga and chanting to Shiva and Rama and singing Bob Dylan songs, even though none of them spoke English. Um, but came back from that trip, both of us kind of looking for kind of an Eastern spiritual discipline and ultimately landed on a, a yoga lifestyle, Kundalini yoga. And so uh, by the time I was 21, um, I was living in a local Kundalini yoga ashram. I was wearing a turban. I'd grown my beard long. I already had a long beard, but it got to grow long, longer. I wrapped my long hair in the turban, and I was getting up at 3 in the morning and practicing yoga as a group in our little yoga commune uh, three hours a day and teaching yoga. and. I was um, uh, I'd just come back from a yoga uh, festival in California, summer solstice festival, and I had planned to go to college that summer just to get it done, uh, get my senior year done early. And I uh, went to the first class and just realized I couldn't couldn't sit in a classroom for the summer. And I literally got up and 
walked out and went and got my refund. And, you know, it's like, well, yeah, I got to get a job, I guess, do something for the summer. And a friend in our yoga community said, hey, um, I know this these, these hippies in, um, in town here that have this little bakery in the back of a, of a natural food store, and they want to get out of it. They want to sell it. And so well, let's, I said, let's go see it. Let's go check it out. And it was um, in the back of this, this natural food store that was owned by the Kesey family. And the Kesey family, uh, their well-known family member, Ken Kesey, who uh, you know was a writer and uh, wrote uh, the book, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which was made into film. Uh, the book, Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test, was written about him in the early 60s and their bus tour across the country with the Merry Pranksters taking LSD. But anyway, that was Ken Kesey, and mm. it was his brother and sister-in-law that ran the creamery, the family creamery. They were making a, a new yogurt called Nancy's Yogurt, and they also had this natural food store. And and it was a, a real, you know, hippie scene. Um, it was going on in Eugene. It's actually Springfield outside of Eugene. But anyway, I made a deal on this little bakery and uh, borrowed $1,000 from my sister. Uh, and we wrote a contract on a piece of cardboard that I would pay him the balance. I think I think I bought it for $2,000 and pay off the balance over the summer and um, got the recipes. It was a going concern. They had customers making whole grain breads and carob brownies. I don't know if you've ever heard of carob, but yeah. at one time chocolate was evil in the early days of natural foods and carob was the alternative. Uh, we also made granola. And um, <clears throat> so uh, we I took it over with the idea of employing people in our yoga community. And uh, so I spent the summer uh, working hard and teaching yoga and practicing yoga. And um, did you have any reservations at the time? I mean, it seems like a big undertaking to just take over this. Not a, this. Don't, not a single reservation. Yeah. Just like, hey, this is cool. This fits. fits. This will, this yeah. will serve our community. It was really about creating jobs and doing right livelihood. And Eugene, Oregon in that era was a real kind of hotbed of uh, cottage uh, alternative lifestyle businesses, whether it be food or clothing or, um, you know, other things. Uh, there was just this kind of great expression of <clears throat> entrepreneurship um, and networking and helping each other. And so it was a very, uh, very great, great time to be, you know, doing a, a business of that, of that type. And, uh, you know, so, you know, I was over my head. I didn't, you know, it's a, it a steep learning curve, but I bought this little van and, you know, we delivered um, 50, you know, 50 gallon garbage, you know, plastic garbage cans full of bulk granola and, you know, to these stores and sounds great bread. And yeah. And uh, it, um, um, you know, I I had to finish college that 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 after that summer, which dawned on me I had to do that. But somehow I managed to get through my college time and still run this bakery the that that last year. What was the then the next milestone for you in business? Well, the next milestone was um, at the end of '73, which was a whole been a whole year since I'd been running the bakery. I got married. I'd met a woman with two children at that previous year's yoga festival. And she ultimately moved up to Eugene late that summer. So I forgot to mention that I was suddenly thrown into a, a parenting role in a new relationship at age 21. But the following spring, um, I got married. Our guru came to town and married us. And it was also the last day of my, my last final in college. So I got married and, um, uh, took that final and the plan was to leave Eugene and move to San Francisco. Uh, the business was doing well. I had turned it over to the community. It wasn't something that I was planning to own for myself, but it was kind of, a, it was kind of an altruistic um, motive. And so it was left to others. It had a good, good flow going. We'd moved to a new location and, and ultimately that, um, that business uh, was called Golden Temple Bakery. And, it uh, uh, in a few years was solely focused on cereal and 
grew into a hundred million dollar uh, natural cereal company. Wow. Uh, but but I was I was not directly involved with it. Um, I uh, so it was summer of seventy three. I wanted to move to San Francisco, be part of the scene there with my new young family. But there was a new ashram, Kundalini Yoga ashram opening there. Uh, we were all planned to go, but. Uh, end up going to Bend to uh, leave a few things in storage with my parents, but uh, the 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 new ashram fell through. Uh, we waited and waited, and then it didn't work out. And so uh, uh, we ended up spending the summer in Bend, and then that fall uh, moved to a town about two hours away called Salem, Oregon, where I have ancestors that homesteaded there and. 1845 off the Oregon Trail. So some deep roots, but it was a pretty quiet little conservative state capital. And I wasn't quite sure if they were ready for family with turbans and, you know, long beard and, you know, ready to teach yoga. But anyway, we settled there and um, found our way. But I quickly by that fall opened a uh, natural food distribution business because um, you know, the nat- natural food was not an industry. It was really more of a movement. But there were all these great innovative products being developed, particularly out of you know Southern and Northern California. And I saw an opportunity to introduce, introduce those to the Northwest. And so I made some contacts in California and it's got some exclusive product lines, mostly uh, yogurt, uh, you know, dairy-based products, uh, um, bought a ref- used refrigerated truck and um, started distributing natural food products from Seattle to uh, Washington, clear down to the southern border of Oregon to co-ops and natural food stores and natural food buying clubs, what used to exist, and um, kind of grew up with, uh, as it became more of an industry, uh, there were, you know, um, you know, these hippies that would run, you know, semi trucks up from California with all kinds of, you know, manufactured products are running freight. And, you know, they were, it was, it was a crazy time. There were a lot of, a lot of characters and, uh, but you felt really linked to a movement and ultimately uh, my little business evolved and I bought a competitor. Um, and so we had semi trucks. We were running and, you know, delivery trucks and, and uh, our ashram grew in, in Salem, Oregon. And we employed a lot of people both inside of our community and outside of our community. We, we also had a natural food restaurant. So, you know, by now we're in mid seventies, 76. Um, um, I started having more children. And so really by 76, I had four children and we were living very communally and um, um, you know our natural food distribution business was linked up with Eugene Bakery. We became kind of one big socialistic experiment. Um, so I really I contributed that distribution business also to our communal communal entity. And um, so um, you know that was working pretty well. I was distributing the bakery products, and and then by seventy eight. Uh, natural food movement had kind of hit a plateau. There'd been a lot of growth and then things kind of leveled out. And that was an era where the first um, first events of businesses going out of business that, you know, none, nobody really knew what they were doing with all these fledgling natural food businesses. We were driven by vision and lifestyle passion, but, you know, nobody really had any skills and let alone any capital. So, you know, all these businesses were very underfunded. So we saw some of the first, I guess you'd call them failures of businesses closing, which were sobering. And even our business was kind of being run on a shoestring and things got tight. And uh, I um, uh, I was always sort of the ringleader of expansion and creating new products and opportunities. Excuse me, I'm gonna hear some noise in the background. Um, I, um, yeah, so I was kind of seen to be a little bit um, controversial because I always had plans for the next new product and I'd created created uh, 
some some brands. Um, and um, so I was basically asked to leave the business uh, because the group wanted to kind of consolidate it and let it calm, you know, calm down a little bit and not try to grow. And, and so, you know, you were pushing little, for more growth. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of a, um, a misalignment of a vision, I guess, or lack of alignment. And so I, uh, I stepped out and not really knowing what we're going to do, but uh, to backtrack a little bit, uh, some of your listeners, older listeners may remember a product called the Wagaru Chu, uh, which we created. It was actually created on my 22nd birthday, but uh, by some of our um, fellow uh, commune people uh, when they were baking granola, they made a little kind of bar made from nuts, nuts and seeds and honey and, and uh, other things. And it, it, it would harden. And it, it, uh, we ended up ultimately packaging it and marketing it. And it was really one of the early, one of the first energy bars. And um, uh, it's not around anymore, but it was around for a few decades. And there's a lot of people have fond memories of Wa Waguru Chu. Chu's, and that, that name uh, is, a, is an Eastern mantra. Uh, and uh, it means uh, infinite bliss. So that's. Uh, that was a uh, one of the things we put a lot of focus it on. Sounds delicious. Well, yeah. what were, just to give people a reference point, Cameron, what were some of the other products on the market? Maybe some of the non-healthy things on the market? Because I totally uh, love the healthy, natural products. So I'm, I'm sure if I was a part of that movement, I would have just devoured everything that was in that, yeah, yeah. In that yeah. arena. Well, what else was on the, in the, on the market? healthy or not healthy at that time? Well, um, you know, the, particularly some of the, I mean, there were, um, uh, there were brands that were coming out of Los Angeles that aren't around anymore. Uh, Altadena Dairy had a natural yogurt line. There was another yogurt line called Continental Yogurt that was run, made by a small company in LA. Uh, it was really very high quality. They made uh, kefir. Uh, which is now popular, but I introduced kefir to the Northwest. It was kind of an unknown, unknown quantity. Um, Celestial Seasonings teas from Colorado were at their very beginning, and I wow. hmm. I ended up with exclusive distributorship of Celestial Seasonings teas. Um, you know, I learned, I distributed um, a brand called Barbara's. Uh, they had snacks, they had a potato chip. Uh, there was a tortilla chip called Have a what was it? They call Have a Chips. They're still around and they haven't changed at all since the '70s. Hmm. Uh, and that's where I kind of learned about the market for chips uh, and distributing those in that in that era. Uh, but um, yeah, there were there were brands, natural food brands that were created, and some have lasted and made the cut. Some have it, but Again, those were heady days of entrepreneurial innovation um, around the natural food world. And I really believe that, uh, I mean, it was in those early days, it was just, you know, that was just a niche. It was for people who had really adopted, an, you know, an alternative lifestyle, but it was, it was a niche. It was far from being mainstream. But I, I had this belief that, you know, kind of my core, core values around that you know the world would start opening up and you know developing and kind of becoming more enlightened around environment and peace and health and how we ate and uh, I believe that natural foods would eventually become mainstream. Were you um, are you surprised by how quickly or slowly that got adopted at all? That's a great question. It seems slow in my my yeah. time because. Um, it did, it did, um, you know, it did take, a, you know, a couple, well, I don't know, it took, i um, just trying to think, um, it really wasn't until the 80s that it started, natural food started to be embraced by supermarkets and, uh, you know, in a tentative way initially, but um, so, you know, that was a good 10, 12 years of very much, um, focusing on the niches 
Did you see um, any key players, products, or companies help with that? You know, like obviously today we we think of Whole Foods, right? And um, I are there any key players that you're that really kind of sped that up? Key players that exist now? No, like in the eighties, like. There were Any part, products part of the, or, part of the yeah. mass market piece. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good question. Um, uh, oof. Sort of those ones that made that transition. Uh, um, you know, I, I know, don't know if there's a crossover product that like some people, it's like tastes good, but it's super healthy and it kind of converted people that were, you know, maybe not the most conscious of their health or or mm-hmm. peace or whatever, and that converted them, but it was because of this product. I don't know if there well, was that, I think, I that think gateway real, product. We'll call it the yeah, gateway product. I mean, to me, which is very personal, but yeah. I think one of the ones that, that uh, fits that is is kettle chips. Uh, and that's why it was really created to be yeah. to be that one. Um, uh, yeah, talk about kettle chips. Juice, there were juice companies, yeah. uh, mm. Newton's Juice. You know, out of Northern California, they were one of those ones that made made that, you know, with a very much of a core natural food beginning, uh, made that transition to um, a bigger, you know, bigger, broader market. Um, so talk about sure. kettle chips, the inception. Well, the inception was so um, here. Here I am with uh, no job, four kids. Um, I'm stressed and, out thinking about no, it. Yeah. No income, uh, <laughs> yeah. living on credit. You're so card. calm. Still yeah. part of our, you know, leader in our community, um, but uh, I had to sort of figure out what I was going to do. Um, this is May of 1978. I knew I could probably take a month to figure that out, and uh, then I had to start gen- generating income. I kind of looked around for, you know, maybe somebody would hire me in the natural food space, but there there wasn't really anything there. And being a guy with a turban and a beard, it kind of limited. Who wanted to hire you? So I, um, um, so sorry. This is nineteen. Uh, yeah, this is nineteen seventy eight. Um, so I had some experience in the natural food industry. So I thought I'll just fall back to what I know. And um, I had a friend who I'd sold a beat up old refrigerated van to a few years before, and I asked him if he still had that, and he said, "Yeah, it's out behind." He was the natural food distribution. Seattle and he had he said yeah it's out sitting in the tall grass behind my warehouse and I said well if I can get it running will you rent it to me <laughs> so I didn't have any money so I did and got it running and uh, started distributing uh, uh, raw milk cheese I had a connection with a manufacturer um, and just started distributing bulk cheese up and down to those same retail customers that evolved into nuts. Um, raw nuts, you know, 50 pound bags of sunflower, organic sunflower seeds, cashews, peanuts, 100 pound bags of peanuts, and then started, well, I've got these nuts, I might as well start roasting them, set up a little roasting plant in Salem, uh, hired a couple people, uh, started oil roasting and then dry roasting, and I thought, well, you got dry roasted nuts, let's make peanut butter and almond butter and cashew butter. So started making those products and, you know, had a, a warehouse and had a little semi truck by then that, that um, with employees that were distributing these to distributors as well as retailers. Uh, but by late 81, I was thinking, you know, I really want to create a brand that has the legs to transcend purely that. I mean, to be a core natural food product, but also to transcend that and and be, you know, be a go-to product, a natural go-to product in in mass market, in supermarkets. And um, because I had distributed chips in the 70s, I always knew that they turned, there was a lot of, they had a high velocity of turnover. Um, people like people love their snacks. And uh, so my goal was to we had these oil, these vats of oil roasters for making nuts. I thought, well, we try to make hand cooked, uh, batch cooked uh, potato chips the way they did, you know, in the early days before it became auto- automated in the 40s and 50s. 
and had nobody to go to to ask <clears throat> questions. There was nobody around that had, at least at that time, I knew that had done that done it that way. So just started experimenting, making a lot of mistakes. But after a few months and the new new crop of summer crop of potatoes, suddenly it came out right. I didn't know why, but we were making consistent chips. And so I had, along with that, developed a, a package, uh, hired a, a designer. He wanted $1,000 to create a logo, which I thought was criminal, but I paid it. You, and, you paid $1,000 for that that old yeah. bakery. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then you're paying $1,000. Yeah. $1, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I could afford neither. But um, but um, the, the first brand name I designed was actually called Pot Chips, the same design that Kettle Chips has today. But in the East Coast, I learned they called original potato chips cooked in a big vat. They called them pot chips because they're made in a pot. So I showed the design to various friends and I got a lot of thumbs down for various reasons. It had too many other connotations. So yeah. Kettle was actually the second choice and um, um, printed bags and uh, started out uh, putting hand filling bags that we would hand fill uh, could make uh, at night in our little nut plant could make 40 cases a night and then started selling them to local natural food stores and distributors. And uh, they were kind of a hit right out of the chute. And so after several months, uh, I knew I needed to expand capacity. And I talked the landlord into building a building across the parking lot from my, my little plant, my little nut plant, which he did. And then I ordered all the wrong equipment uh, to expand and uh, uh, talked a banker into, which he shouldn't have done, loaning the money for that. And anyway, got that put together by the fall and, you know, expanded production and then got uh, by, um, this was um, late 82 and by early 1983, got my first order from a supermarket chain, which was Safeway Northern California, an entire semi load of wow. kettle chips they ordered and thought, wow, this is great. So we had to put on a second shift uh, to fulfill that. And uh, what we didn't know was really how you manage uh, oil in a fryer that it does decompose, uh, decompose in that it, uh, a component called free fatty acids, it, gets too much oxygen with with the frying and the oil starts to deteriorate. We didn't understand that. And we were we were naive and lucky that just running a single day shift, uh, we create we maintained a certain balance with the oil, but by putting on a second shift mm. and threw that balance off, but we made, you know, all these chips and fulfilled the order and sent it down there. And then uh, a couple of days later got this call kind of an angry call from the buyer saying, come back, you know, come and pick up this product. It's, it's bad. It's, it's the oil's bad. It's rancid. We're refusing, we're refusing this product. Now, what? And so then we started checking our existing inventory and, you know, it, it tasted fine when it left our plant, but after a few days, because of this oil, the, the taste was bad. And so that began, you know, that began a real trial by fire is a, we didn't know why, um, and we had to learn, but we also uh, had put, you know, inferior product out and our consumers were getting a bad taste. So we had to quickly hustle and get all this product off the shelves and out of the warehouses. Um, but we also had to learn from our mistakes and how to, you know, how to make kettle chips consistently in a proper way. And so that took, that took weeks to. What was the original flavor? Original flavor was uh, lightly salted and no salt. Got it. So just two two flavors, if you want to call yeah. no salt a flavor. Uh, and then <laughs> within, a year, is, yeah. within a year, there was a third flavor called red chili. That was a very kind of, you know, for people that love really hot food, they loved it, but uh, was not for your common uh, palate. <laughs> it was a raw, hot, spicy northern New Mexico chilies. Um, but anyway, we got through that crisis, uh, and figured out what we'd done wrong, had to make some modifications of equipment. Uh, we actually created a lab and started analyzing our oil and got some advice, uh, 
um, and carried forward. But I, I thought we potentially could have blown it. And I had basically bet the company on this expansion and there was a good chance the whole company could have folded. Uh, but I still had the nut operation going on that really kind of held the, the chip operation up while it was kind of finding its way. But it really took a solid two years to figure out how to make, even at a basic level, how to make kettle chips in a consistent manner because we were using a russet Burbank potato, which is the hardest variety to make potato chips out of because uh, we chose it because of the high natural sugar content. And that's what gives the potato chip a flavor, but that's also what makes it unstable when you store it. It's constantly wanting to convert the starches to sugar. And so from day to day, you don't really know your core ingredient, how it's going to react. Uh, we got pretty good at it, but we got really good at it eventually. But um, those early days, it was every day was a kind of a new adventure of making kettle chips. But um, um, we had a really committed group of people. Yeah, I was going to ask how you survived, but it sounds like because of the nuts side of the business, you were able to, I don't know if hedge is the right word, but at least have a diversified, you know, income stream. Yeah. So yeah. that really yeah. helped. Yeah, without that, it would have been uh, probably wouldn't have made it through through that era. But um, I also had uh, going back to my early first business of the bakery. I also had a kind of a belief of of really, uh, um, you know, you you treat your employees with respect, and you really treat them as kind of a community uh, where you attract hopefully people with a shared passion for what you're doing, and you know, you, you make it exciting. You make it uh, not just drudgery work, but you're, there's a purpose that you're all there for is doing something exceptional and, you know, giving back to the community and sort of having a little bit of a higher purpose. And so I was always pretty fortunate to generally attract people that really cared about what they did and cared about the mission. And that's what, that's really what got us through those difficult years. Um, because we were we were figuring it out as we go. I mean, we were nobody was expert at what we we're doing, but it was there was a dedication. So I've always been grateful for that. Yeah, what sticks out throughout this whole you know journey is community and movement. It seems to be a, a community and movement. And what was another milestone? So Safeway was a positive and uh, negative. a negative milestone in the same respect. What was another milestone? With, with kettle chips, because you were able to turn well, things around and figure things out. Yeah, I mean, there's, there have been, I mean, there were a lot of milestones and I'll sort of fast, fast forward. Um, you know, um, this, you know, we're 82 is when kettle chips was introduced. Uh, by the mid, mid 80s, 85, 86, we were really kind of hitting, hitting stride. Uh, we had a, you know, up and down the West Coast, uh, distribution. Uh, we had uh, some regional supermarkets that were placing it, you know, in in both their natural sets, but starting to place it in the, the regular snack section too, next to Frito Lay, and um, things were were working uh, pretty well. Uh, by uh, eighty seven, I uh, decided that things were going well enough. I'd never been to Europe. And I wanted just to go see Europe and particularly study the food cultures in Europe. And my, uh, my oldest son by then, uh, one, one of those two kids that I, I connected with at a yoga festival who was by then 19 years old, um, <clears throat> um, we decided that we would together uh, take motorcycles to Europe and spend six weeks traveling together and just experiencing the cultures which which we did in the fall of 87 and uh that was you know it was kind of um not unlike the trip to japan i took in 1970 um those were kind of life-changing trips and without really knowing that or anticipating that would happen but we had a really awesome trip from we landed in um, scotland we put our motorcycles on a a freight airline that had had a few seats. It doesn't exist anymore, so we could fly with our motorcycles. And then we had to meet meet a flight on a date six weeks 
later. And so we, our plan was to drive through Scotland, England, and through Europe, and and uh, end up in Greece, and then turn around and reverse that by a different route. But um, so got to experience all these great food cultures and ex- and other experiences, and um, um, and then on the way through London, both going and coming back from the continent, I had met a gentleman a few weeks before I left Oregon who was an Oregon native but was living in London and he invited us to stay in his uh, home in London, which we did going both ways. But on the way back, um, we stayed there for several days and we started talking about, he was a former banker that had left the banking world, was trying to sort of figure out what he was going to do next. And he was intrigued by kettle chips. And so we started talking about, well, well, you know, sort of just a fun thing to talk about. What if kettle chips came to England? What would that be like? And would there even be interest? And we actually uh, sent my son out into the supermarkets to bring in every snack, every potato chip and other snack foods. And we put them out on a big table and kind of tasted and analyzed and really um, surmised that there that the market was changing just beginning to change in the UK where they're starting just the beginning of embracing natural products and uh, <clears throat> saw an opportunity for kettle chips to really be a kind of a catalyst brand for that movement. And so I wrote up a, on, you know, legal paper by hand, um, you know, kind of a perception of the market and agreed with my friend that I'd come back in the spring and together we'd research it more and this was October and you know we flew back and you know got back immersed immersed in my life uh in Oregon and kind of that put that to the back of the mind but by got busy and by late January he sent a uh bought my he sent a uh I bought my first fax machine and so he'd sent a fax and said well you know I'd been doing this research and this and checking this out and so what date, what date are you coming? And I was like, oh yeah, I, I committed that I would go back. I guess I gotta fulfill that. And so I bought a my first suit, suit and tie, and and uh, figuring you gotta be dressed up to do business in England. I, I didn't know. And uh, flew over there in early March. And uh, he he'd made some appointments. We went and uh with a buyer from Marks and Spencer, and you know, we uh, uh went and visited a uh, potato supplier up in an uh, area called Norfolk. Uh, it's an agricultural area, a couple hours north of London. And the potato guy say, hey, I, there's a, you know, there's a small potato chip manufacturer. If you're interested in seeing, meeting somebody who's making potato chips, we said, sure. So we went and, you know, they're making potato chips the, uh, the, the modern way on, you know, conveyorized belts using potatoes that were bred for that that kind of processing, which means they bred out the sugars, they're very bland, but um, you know, their product was uninspiring. But I noticed half their factory was empty and it sort of a light bulb went on and said, wow, we could we could come over here and do a creative deal and utilize. Um, but um anyway, that we I was just there a week, but um we ended up just serendipitously putting together uh, relationships and partnerships that uh, by the time I left at the end of the week, we had a we had a plan hatch, which we had a facility that these guys would be willing to sub sublet us space if I brought in my equipment and even you know contract some of their labor. Um, we had a potato supplier that really understood the differentiation that we were trying to do with potatoes, and um, I I began. You know, and they introduced some alternative supply, uh, alternative varieties. They didn't have russet Burbank wasn't being grown, but some other varieties that had high sugar. And uh, I actually began a series of smuggling uh, British potatoes back to Oregon. Uh, you're not really supposed to do it, do that. And I learned to put it in a duffel bag with my dirty laundry so that customs wouldn't look at it. But it was the only way I could test them on our fryers back in Oregon to see what would work. But, um, and then the third piece was we, we made a connection with a um, company making, the first company to make tortilla chips in England. And they were doing it on a very natural, 
high quality way and had made a pretty good splash in England. They were smart marketers and we had visited them up in uh, Durham, England and agreed that they would uh, help us market it. Uh, they owned a distribution company and help us um, with the sales and marketing. And so uh, this was March and uh, I started making monthly trips to England to try to evolve this plan and vision. And um, I, um, um, you know, managed to uh, talk a local banker in Oregon to uh, loan me the money, uh, which again, he shouldn't have because it was a hugely risky deal to, you know, why should this little natural food brand that's only sold on the West Coast why should it leap clear across the country, clear across the Atlantic, skip that and introduce it in England and introduce it largely to the mass market because there wasn't a very evolved, there wasn't the level of natural food industry in England as there was in the US. So this was taking a big, uh, a big bet that um, kettle chips would, this natural product would be, a, you know, would be viable in the supermarkets. Uh, so by, um, you know, it took almost a year to set up the little plant with the furniture that I, for the, for the equipment that I acquired, and I did acquire the right, for, right equipment at that time, uh, the learning had really evolved uh, to do it right and um, been through some iterations of these contracts. But um, by January of 1989, we began making kettle chips in this section of this potato chip factory that we had rented and we launched it at an international food show in London uh, with the help of this company in Durham that also had their tortilla chip. And then uh, we, we had landed on a certain variety of potatoes that was used in the fish and chips world um, that had their own version of unique flavor. And uh, we were off and going. So the product got launched um, into a, a group of small uh, direct distributors that service the shelves, a whole group of them. We had uh, rented a space at the uh, London Heathrow Airport where we uh, invited all these distributors and unveiled kettle chips with the help of this partner company. And there was a lot of excitement. And the um, product went out into the market. And then um, everything went quiet. We didn't get it. We weren't getting uh, reorders. And uh, of course, we had no marketing. We had no marketing budget. It was all meant to be word of mouth. We were also offering a size of package that had never been offered, a bigger package, a premium price point that had never been you know, done in the uh, potato chip world. So we came in very premium. My, uh, uh, my friend that was helping me that with that, my London-based friend who'd been a banker, he insisted he was a financial guy, and he said he, he insisted that we need to have a premium price, get you know outstanding margins, um, so that we could reinvest in this brand and and grow it when the time comes. And so I I, I was pretty initially um, uh, uncomfortable uh, with um, for coming out at this premium. I mean, much higher premium even relative to the US, what we're doing. But we, um, we launched with a premium and then we weren't getting any orders. And so I thought, well, it's one of two things. They're just rejecting the price and maybe the product. Um, or it's just uh, gonna take time for word of mouth. We had no idea if they liked it or not. Uh, the sole uh, test market we'd done months earlier is I'd brought 10 cases of Oregon US based kettle chips on a plane. And we, um, they were kind of our smaller one ounce bags, but we talked, talked a little convenience store in a train station in London to put them on their shelf. And we'd give it to them for free. And but we dictated the price and um, gave them the 10 cases and they sold out in a week. So that was our, uh, that was our sole test market. Based on that, we, I, you know, I committed, you know, debt and committed, you know, the equipment and committed to launching this product in 
January of 89. So uh, a couple months went by and I I would, you know, back and forth, I'd go back to the US and, and then back to the UK. But, you know, I was stressed because I had truly bet the company on the debt that I had taken on. And it, if it didn't, if we failed in, in the UK, it would have taken the whole US company under as well. Um, and so uh, orders started to trickle in after about uh, six weeks. And, um, and then we got to the beginning of, of June. And so I started feeling better. And I, I was over there in June. But all of a sudden, it was like somebody switched on the, you know, or, or put things into high gear, or switched the, the bright lights gear uh, switch on. That suddenly uh, demand just went through the roof. We just were inundated with demand. There was just a critical mass of, I think, word of mouth and enough people that tried it. And, you know, all these stores wanted it. All five of the major, major supermarket chains, buyers called us, including Marks and Spencers. Um, and um, it was just, we were overwhelmed. And so we spent the next, um, many years just chasing that demand and uh, we didn't really do any marketing we just built up capacity and built built up our organization of workers as you know as quickly as we could to meet demand and kettle chips became a symbol uh, for kind of the cultural change that was happening in the UK and my perception in the 1987 and seeing the glimmer of this lifestyle change around health and fitness and natural foods, better foods. Um, kettle chips became one of the symbols for that change. And the stores wanted that in there, in their stores because they wanted those consumers. And uh, so the brand, the brand grew up very fast in the UK and uh, uh, eventually surpassed the business we were doing in Oregon. Um, and it, became profitable relatively quickly because of those margins. And this gentleman, a uh, former banker, ultimately became a partner in the company. I gave him some sweat equity shares because I needed somebody based in the UK to watch over things. I couldn't live there full time. So um, uh, that, um, that was an amazing experience. I really enjoyed doing business in the UK and ultimately in Europe. I just liked the way they did business and maybe still do, uh, but the brand uh, became a pretty big brand over there, and we we began making uh, uh, Marks and Spencer's own label, uh, and they're very demanding on quality. They have their own food food scientists that go out in the field uh, and tour and make sure their suppliers are doing the best job possible, and so. They really, we were forced to grow in sophistication, our organization around quality and being more scientific. And it was, you know, it was, we had some hard, hard meetings with them at times where we were not, you know, meeting their standards. But really, I, I really have them to thank for, you know, growing, growing the organization's uh, capacities to, you know, have, have proper disciplines and make, make the very best products. Yeah, Cameron, I want to hear how, um, yeah, it's, it's, I feel like the journey is riveting. You know, it's, um, you, you say things calmly now. I can't imagine, you know, there's a lot of moving pieces with all of this. Um, yeah, I'd love and, to, he yeah, yeah, go ahead. But I say, well, and I'll say that there were, um, you know, it, it kind of became part of the popular culture at that time. And it became, uh, it was on a, um, comedy show, a, a woman named Ruby Ratwax, who was very popular then, but she just put it, you know, put it on her show and had skits using the product. Um, you know, we had, it just kind of became in the media, you know, none, none of which we were investing in. Um, there was an experience, my partner and I and his wife went to a, what kind of, what was the, the happening restaurant in London at the time, a celebrity chef. And we went and had, you know, a little celebration of what was happening on a Friday night and had a, had a meal. And we were the last ones to leave, leave the restaurant. Um, 
And, you know, we got out on the sidewalk. My partner knew the owner and the owner came out and said, we'd like you guys to come back in to the dining room for a second. And, okay, whatever. And we came back in and he had his whole staff, the chefs and the servers and the bussers. And they were, they were all assembled in the living room or in the, the, the dining room. And I was like, well, what's, what's going on here? And then they all, they all started clapping us and, and um, just giving us praise for launching this product in, in the UK that uh, people love so much and that it had a high standard of quality. And that, you know, that was a very moving kind of humbling, humbling thing that here is kind of one of the best noteworthy restaurants in London and their staff is, is and including their owners recognizing, uh, you know, this, this product that we brought from Oregon. So, you know, there was a lot of kind of nice, um, ego builders, I guess. Yeah. It's, I, I mean, it's well, but gra- gratifying. It's pretty telling. And, um, it, you took a big risk. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. You, you took a big risk. There's no doubt about it. And, um, you know, I would love to hear. So I want to talk about Kona. Um, but how did the journey, I wouldn't say end, but, but kind of start to conclude for you with kettle chips and, and one of my personal favorites of this journey is the sea salt, rosemary, and garlic. That's mm-hmm. my personal kettle chip mm-hmm. favorite. But um, how did things then evolve and progress towards when, I don't know if you stepped away or, or what, you know, how that concluded your journey with yeah. kettle chips? Yeah, so um, really, um, uh, you know, the path. Uh, so, you know, ultimately, I found myself as the CEO of a, you know, somewhat global snack business, uh, kettle chips continued to grow in the U S and, um, was the, in the, in the natural, uh, snack category was the leader in the U S and, um, and then it grew into the, you know, into the, uh, the supermarkets as well. And so, you know, we managed a, a team on both sides of the, of the ocean and, um, uh, you know, Kettle Foods was really built on some real simple core values of um, commitment to co- to quality, above all um, um, respect for your team, um, and um, and then being responsible and giving back to the community. And those were, you know, those we propagated both in the UK and the and the US. And um, you know, our as a result, we had a great a great people culture and a lot of very dedicated, dedicated individuals. And that, that to me is really the core, the core of the success of, of kettle chips and kettle foods was this great, great community of people that were extremely dedicated. Um, but really by now we're in the two thousands. Um, I, um, um, I, I don't know if you want me, you know, I'm kind of going chronologically, but I can, I can kind of wind up, wind up the uh, kettle chip story, and then I'll go backwards to the yeah, yeah, that's perfect to the, to the Kona Brewing. Um, but uh, anyway, the brand grew, you know, grew significantly. Um, I think by you know the time we're in the you know low hundreds of millions, hundred, you know, we were in the hundreds of you know hundred million uh, category uh, globally. Um, we decided to. Uh, we needed to have a board. We were, you know, we had hundreds of employees and it was just my partner and I usually making decisions in a pub and it gotten big enough. We need to have some disciplines and um, recruit a proper CEO and, and a, create a board. And my partner had uh, a friend who had founded a uh, private equity group, L. Catterton Partners is what it's called now, a guy named Michael Chu, who I got to know. And he was very brand oriented, and and um, we started talking to him about our next phase. And he said, "Well, you know, we'd be interested in investing you guys and help help you, um, myself and my lead guy um, uh, Scott Danke. We would be happy to be your board members." And so my partner and I talked about it long and hard, and decided to take a minority investment in 2004, and um, uh, largely because um, we had, our company was very profitable, you know, twenty percent 
uh, EBITDA on, on revenue. Um, but we really wanted these guys on our board and for them to help guide us in building the next phase of the company and, and create proper strategies and recruit a CEO. So we did that. And then we recruited a really awesome CEO. Uh, we got really lucky, a guy named Paul Davis. And so I stepped back and my partner stepped back. As board members, I became chair and there were five of us on the board and uh, um, and we met uh, as often as needed, but we we did a, developed a strategy plan, uh, got some outside help to how what the potential for the uh, kettle brand would be, and began exercising that. And after um, a couple of years of that, we started and and we were having very strong growth. We started having um, um, some companies sniffing around. Um, wanting to talk about acquisitions. And we felt it was a little bit premature, but we said, well, if it's the right people and they offer, you know, the right value, if they recognize the right value, we would consider that. And so uh, a group did. Uh, it was another London-based private equity group called Lion Capital. And so we, we sold the company to them uh, completely in 2006. And, you know, what they got was, you know, a really strong growth oriented brand with a great team with a, a real active, vital company culture uh, and a strategy plan that we were only two years into a five year plan. And they, they executed on that plan the next three years and um, did really well. They, you know, doubled the business and, you know, I think tripled the EBITDA, and uh, it was uh, it was then sold to a a food manufacturer. But um, yeah, the brand continues to thrive. It's amazing. And part of Snack Division, uh, Snyder's Lance uh, Lance Snyder Snack Division, part of Campbell Soup, but it still still does well. And I I visit our original factory in Salem, Oregon every couple of years and they still practice a lot of those core values and still have the, the um, signs in the wall that support those values. Mm. And some of the old timers are still there, but uh, wow. yeah, very fulfilling. But I, I put my 28 years into that. I was, I was kind of ready to. I'm to sure. On. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. So where does Kona come into the picture? Well, um, you know, I've had a habit of starting businesses in places where I want to spend time. And that's what happened with Kettle Foods and going, you know, opening an operation in England was uh, the primary motivator really was I wanted to spend more more time in England and Europe because I really enjoyed being over there. And uh, opening a business was a kind of an excuse and a and a discipline of you've got to you got to be there. So in 1993, um, my father had just passed away a few weeks earlier, but I'd had a planned trip to Kona, Hawaii with my family. My oldest son had come to Kona with his girlfriend that summer on a vacation, didn't come back. They found paradise and jobs. And so uh, I'd never been to the big island of Hawaii, but I brought my family over and for Thanksgiving, which was a few, min few months later, and we rented a vacation rental uh, and with some friends that came along on a little bay on South Kona. I didn't even really know where it was. My son had kind of recommended it. And um, I just, we were here for 10 days, but I uh, I had an epiphany. Um, just was kind of moved by this place, this bay, a specific zone in South Kona. It's an old fishing village, very authentic Hawaii, old school Hawaiian. And there was kind of a, um, a powerful spiritual sense I had about the place. It's hard to explain it uh, in a you know practical manner, but I uh, said so I've got to figure out how to live here in this specific spot, at least part time. And um, out of that same trip, uh, my son and I we started talking, and and my idea was there. I mean, my thoughts were, well, if I'm going to live here. There's got to be some fresh craft beer because I was from Portland, Oregon, where kind of was the epicenter of the how craft beer started in the U S and there were lots of 
examples of, of some wonderful craft brewing operations. And I almost started a small brewery with a partner in Portland at one a couple of years earlier, but didn't. Um, so we had the idea, well, there was no beer, no beer of any kind aside from um, home brewers, but no, com no commercial beer of any type being brewed in the whole state. And we thought, well, why don't we, why don't we start a craft brewery? I'll, you know, I'll mentor you, you teach you to be the general manager and we get it started together and I'll, I'll find the capital. And so um, we did. And I, and I told him, you know, you've got two years of my time. I'm, I was still CEO of Kettle Foods. So I was very busy, but I'll, you know, I'll come over and help you with this. And so, um, you know, and that took, um, took about a year to um, put it together. Uh, we designed, I, uh, in Portland, Oregon, and hired a, a gentleman from a brewery who was their facilities guy to moonlight and design some brewing equipment. And I had a, a, fabric, a stainless steel fabricator I used for Kettle Foods that had never built brewing equipment. It was, you couldn't really buy off the shelf brewing craft brewing equipment at that time. Uh, it was just starting to become available. But anyway, we, you know, redesigned the wheel and uh, um, brought this equipment over here and um, got it, got it started in, uh, um, we had our, our blessing, opening blessing on Valentine, Valentine's Day of 1995. Uh, we'd incorporated in 94. And the goal is to be uh, a leader in the market. It's a small market, but it has a lot of visitors. And by then, uh, two other little breweries had opened. Uh, we all kind of opened within a month of each other. These other two in Oahu. Uh, but the vision was from the start to be the ultimate leader, um, um, you know, there, there had been a pre previous brand in Hawaii uh, for a hundred years that, you know, was kind of the signature that had this um, following, but it, it was no longer around. And uh, so it was this opportunity to become the signature Hawaiian beer. Um, so, um, you know, again, we learned the hard way, uh, made some, for batches initially. Uh, we bought a used Italian bottling line that didn't work half the time. And we'd have to air freight parts from Italy, which was very expensive. Oh, yeah. We also yeah. found it was very, you know, doing business in Hawaii and particularly manufacturing in Hawaii is very expensive. It's the most expensive state in the US and also taxes are the highest here and including liquor taxes uh, to distribute. You've got to just ship your beer from one island to the next island to the next island. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we got, got our products out there in hotels and resorts and stores, but uh, we were losing our shirts about $20,000 a month. And uh, that went on for, you know, a couple of years. And um, I was having to, uh, to fill that gap with, money that I was pulling out of Kettle Foods as it was prospering. I was having to, you know, rob from Peter to pay Paul. And, um, and then, um, you know, after a couple of years of this, uh, my son uh, then left, left the business. And um, I um, brought a young guy in from Oregon that had never run a manufacturing business, but um, uh, you know, and my son did a great job getting the kind of the beachhead established. And he hired friends, a, a brewer and a guy who had a uh, degree in marketing and communication. So he was the salesman. And, you know, through that team, we, we made our beachheads, but we then needed to make, you know, a next step. And my, um, my son uh, departed and uh, we kind of ended up turning over during that period, that whole team, they moved back to the mainland and, you know, brought in new people. And uh, it was kind of a, a reboot, if you if you will. And uh, this one gentleman I brought, he, he didn't have manufacturing experience, but he had a restaurant and specifically gourmet pizza restaurant experiences. And that was part of the goal master plan it was develop a, a pub as part of our, our brewery. We just had a tasting room. and. Uh, 
So um, we we learned uh, in those first few months of that next phase that we really needed, we couldn't bottle beer and do it profitably in Hawaii. And we needed to find a contract brewer on the West Coast. We also needed to get our pub opened to improve those margins from making beer in the back and selling it at full retail in the front. And so, you know, that took, in the beginning of that phase, that took about a year and a half to accomplish that, to find that contact contract brewer in California and to open this pizza pub. Um, and literally the month that we opened that pub and began bringing the bottles from bottled beer from California to Hawaii, uh, we went from uh, red ink to black black ink and uh, really didn't didn't look back and uh, so we continued to brew draft beer in our brewery in Hawaii and bring in our our bottled beer uh, from the mainland and um, that relationship uh, where we ended ultimately ended up uh, having our contract relationship it wasn't in the beginning but after a year or so we ended up uh, with uh, a friend of mine who the Widmer Widmer brothers in Oregon that had a, a pretty good sized brewery. They just built a new brewery uh, and had lots of capacity and invited us to bring our contract business to, to them. And so I did that. And then um, over time, um, that was working really well. And they said, well, we've got this whole sales team. Why don't we do a, a partnership thing and we'll start more, you know, selling it in the mainland? We were dabbling in that on ourselves and not being very successful. And we said, okay, let's, let's, let's do that. But in order to do that, we had to trade some minor shares because um, Widmer Brewing was owned 32% by Anheuser-Busch. And to access the Anheuser-Busch distribution system, there had to be some ownership relationship to Anheuser-Busch. So we um, did that stock trade and had, a, uh, I think, seven different contractual agreements that were created. Um, and so um, we began uh, selling beer uh, in the mainland U.S. And uh, that ended up being a fortuitous relationship because that, that grew, the brand grew, uh, our business in Hawaii um, evolved, our little pub grew into a $10 million a year restaurant with lots of t-shirt and hat and you know, logo wear sales. Liquid and, love. Yeah. Liquid aloha. Oh, oh. Liquid, liquid aloha. Is what aloha, yeah, exactly. And we opened another restaurant pub in uh, in, in Oahu, just outside of Honolulu. Um, but um, the brand uh, the brand began growing in the mainland and and Anheuser-Busch was our distributor here in Hawaii. And that, you know, that, that distribution relationship with Anheuser Busch turned into a real key to the success of Kona Brewing uh, because they have the best distribution yeah. you know, in the world. And we also had a strong sales team. Um, I'll, I'll say that um, I'll go back to briefly, I'll uh, digress that uh, I, in creating the brand, um, I um, was going to make an early trip to Hawaii to pitch the Anheuser Busch distributor in Hawaii, but you know we were nothing. We didn't even have a logo, and so I I, I approached my um, uh, approached my cousin who was a graphic designer, and I said I need a logo. This was Thursday. I need a logo by Monday uh, because I need to make up no some t-shirts and a business card uh, to um, pitch these guys in Hawaii. She said, well, I, you know, I don't work under that kind of speed. And I said, well, just give it a try. And she she nailed the logo by Monday. I mean, it's the logo that still exists. And I said, you've got it. It's it's great. So I had a couple, uh, some polo shirts, silkscreen and business cards. And my son and I went and pitched um, pitched ourselves to, um, um, you know, to the Anheuser-Busch distributor. But anyway, um, fast forward. Um, uh, the relationship with Widmer uh, did eventually evolve. Uh, by 2010, we did a full merger 
together. Uh, so um, Kona Brewing became, you know, a full full piece of of what what was then called Craft Brew Alliance, which had um, Red Hook Brewing also was part of its group. So we became part of a group, and um, um, and that allowed the Kona brand to expand, uh, particularly in the mainland, because that group had their own existing breweries. By then, they had one in the East Coast, one in Seattle, and of course, one in Portland. And so uh, part of our philosophy with the Kona brand was to um, put it, you know, to produce it close to its market and limit it, you know, limit its carbon footprint. And so that that really became, uh, you know, important part of our model is rather than make beer in Hawaii with one big brewery and ship it all to the mainland, which is expensive uh, and, you know, eats up a lot of uh, of uh, fuel and whatnot, um, our product uh, Kona Brewing was being made in in um, four four locations: you know, Kona, Hawaii, Portland, Seattle, and Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Mm. Uh, and so uh, we ran with that uh, in the last um, decade, and uh, the Kona brand became uh, by last summer the eighth uh, largest craft brand in the U.S. by volume size and uh of the top 10 by last summer only two of them that were actually still growing um uh, and um and has a bush uh had their sights um on kona brewing uh for the last few years and we had actually had approached us and there were some options that didn't work out but um late last summer we we completed a uh, a full merger of the parent company, Craft Brew Alliance, which you know Kona Brew, Kona brand was seventy percent of that. Of that, that was the dominant brand of that that group, and uh, so now it's all under um, Anheuser Busch's Craft uh, uh, Alliance. It's called, uh, or, um, and um, that's um, a group of about twenty five. Uh, craft breweries that they own, which Kona is one of the bigger, the mm -hmm. bigger ones. But uh, the journey, the journey of Kona Brewing has been a really rich one. The engagement in the community, uh, we've supported uh, all kinds of events and ambassadors of watermen and waterwomen, and um, it's you know it's just a great culture here. We always pledge to respect the traditional Hawaiian culture and uh, engaged and contributed a lot of the perpetuation of the culture and the company still does that today but a really great fun rich experience of that and all i ever wanted out of it was i wanted to drink to live in hawaii <laughs> live in hawaii drink uh free beer from complimentary beer and complimentary pizza at the pub and so that's what i've gotten to do the last 20 plus years is I've never ever taken a salary out of the business. Um, but, um, and then with this, uh, this um, sale, uh, and I have a draft system at my home, I live on the bay that I had the epiphany, I was eventually able to buy a property and build a home. I live in that spot in 1993, spoke mm. to me and it still speaks to me today. Mm. That's why I'm here. And under even under the new ownership, I continue as a uh, advisor, and I still get my free beer and pizza. So I'm. I think you deserve happy. it at this yeah. point. <laughs> yeah. So that's a twenty, you know, almost twenty-seven year journey there. Wow, Cameron. First of all, I really appreciate you sharing your stories. You've been super generous with your time. I have one last question before I okay. ask it. Um, everyone should check out the HealyFoundation.org. Check out what they're doing there. Check out other episodes of the, the podcast and Rise 25. Um, Cameron, my last question, um, there's just been a uh, treasure trove of, of gems of uh, lessons here that you've shared, and I appreciate that. Um, my last question is just, what are some of your favorite natural snacks that you like? I mean, we've talked about kettle chips. I talked about wild tonic kombucha. Um, 
I've had other people like Truth Bar on the on the podcast, which I, I love just having the products that I love to eat and consume. I'm curious, what are some of your favorites uh, over like currently or over the years? Yeah, well, of course, I still eat kettle chips. I, I did not negotiate free kettle chips, unfortunately. <laughs> so I do still still purchase those. Um, um, I um, and I still eat uh, that. Uh, have a chips, which I mentioned I distributed in the 70s that haven't changed packaging or formula wise um, at all since then. And so uh, that tends to be my go to tortilla chip. I, I eat some some others as well. Uh, but um, uh, I do like kind bars when I'm out uh, active um, in the out of doors. Um, I do like, uh, there's a brand of, what are they called? Epic. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Meat, Epic, snacks. yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not a big meat eater, but I like their salmon strips, and I eat those when I travel. Um, uh, gosh, and then just, you know, here in Hawaii, we've got macadamia nuts. Farmers are always giving me raw macadamia nuts that they've harvested and cracked, so I eat macadamia nuts here. I love them. Um, I love uh, almonds and make my own trail mix and uh, make my own granola. Uh, I eat granola as a snack. Um, you know, that's gets kind of yeah. kind of it. You know, but I'm I'm still a you know I'm still a chip fiend, and I have to say that if kettle chips are if they're if they're actually, if they're to be bad for you, I would be dead now because I've eaten you know I've eaten probably more kettle chips than anybody. <laughs> on the planet I still do and I'm 70 years old and I'm surfing and you know doing all kinds of active things but there you go uh, anyway it's uh, it's been a nice yeah nice journey and I'm I feel privileged to uh, be able to uh, run this foundation and have impacts in areas that um, really deserve it and I think particularly during COVID the hunger you know the food scarcity and the child hunger was just appalling and heart-wrenching and we were able to pivot last april and take um you know take a, a you know a quarter of our funding for the year and contribute it just in the month of april to covid to nonprofits that were addressing the um impacts of covid and uh on families and kids and uh, our team really really did a great job in ex executing that and uh that's are there other causes get. that you may want to mention what do you remember any of the causes that you know there, there they may have handled. a whole a whole number of of nonprofit but you know food pantries and um groups that do work around uh, uh domestic abuse particularly with children uh you know people that just are doing the hard work on front lines but i think what gave me inspiration through this last year of COVID and all the other stuff that was going down was, you know, was being able to be a funder and a support of these people that that operate these nonprofits in the, in the Oregon and Hawaii where we we do our work is these people that have such a positive giving service attitude and making a real impact. It's not political. They just get on with it and go in, you know, with some of the hardest, most difficult environments and make a difference and that that really gave me positive inspiration through the year and kept me from becoming a little bit um, despondent of some of the things that were going on so I feel very uh, very humbled and proud to be part of that that particular yeah. movement Cameron I want to be the first one to thank you thank you everyone check out the Healy Foundation.org and uh, we'll see you on the next episode thank Bye. you Jeremy thanks for your time what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.